the center in Leiden uh, and Amsterdam. Uh, she is a, a adult congenital person who has an interest in fetal cardiology and in nosology. And she is going to talk to us this morning about the development and morphological classification of common arterial trunk. And I note that she has used the appropriate term uh, to define this condition. So Monique, let's uh, have you without any further ado, uh, give us um, uh, your uh, take on the development and classification of this condition. <laughs> you have yes. to share your well, screen. Yes, yes. Thank you very yeah. much. I'll screen, uh, share my screen now. Okay, so um, one moment, please. Um, I think it's the same as it's not a match as if I. Okay, so one moment, please. Um, can you see my screen? Okay, so, um, uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and especially to, to Joanna. Uh, for to talk here today about uh, development uh, and morphology of common arterial trunk. Can you see my full screen just to check? Dr. Silverman, maybe you can uh, you can tell me if, if my full screen is visible or only yes. part of the screen. Yes, perfect. Yes, Monica. okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a little bit problem. Myself. Yes. So a common arterial trunk is defined as a single arterial trunk that leaves the heart by way of a single arterial valve and that gives rise directly to the coronary, systemic, and one or both pulmonary arteries. And according to the segmental sequential analysis, there is a single outlet ventricular arterial connection. During normal development of the outflow tract, the developing heart tube is initially unseparated and therefore needs to evolve from a single tube to a dual vascular structure, which necessitates septation at several levels. And below here, you can see the septation at, um, at the level of the valvular level. And as we will see later on, there are um, several key players and uh, two very important key players that we'll, we will hear more about are the neural crest cells and cells of the second heart field. This animation shows this process of the development of the embryological heart that starts out as a single tube and that will grow and remodel to a fully septated heart um, with here the remodeling and the positioning of the outro tract that will be wedged uh, in between uh, the both, uh, both atria. Uh, for, from a pathomorphological pet view um, of the common arterial trunk, there is a defect at three levels. Mm. So we'll have, we'll have a deficient septation at the level of the outro tract, uh, resulting in the presence of a subarterial uh, VSD the level of the arterial valve, resulting in a, in a single truncal valve, and also the level of the great arteries, which results in an unseparated proximal part of the aorta uh, and the pulmonary trunk. The embryological structure responsible for a proper separation of the outro tract is the so-called orthopulmonary septum. And the orthopulmonary septum is formed by a contiguous contribution of neural crest cells that are indicated here uh, in blue, um, and in the microscopic section here in brown. And these neural crest cells migrate to the heart from the crest of the neural tube during early development. For a sufficient separation of the different levels of the embryonic outflow tract, both a proper development of the aortopulmonary septum, as well as a proper fusion of the cushions in the outflow tract uh, is necessary. Uh, I'll get back to that, uh, to that a little bit later. And a deficient migration of those neural crest cells um, has been associated with common arterial trunk in many animal studies. For instance, if we ablate the neural crest in chicken embryos, uh, this will result in a common arterial trunk. But also in, uh, in mouse uh, models, we have seen this, uh, this occurring. But it is uh, very important to realize that in the past decade, we have also learned that neural crest cells uh, are not the only cells involved in development of common arterial trunk. And in fact, common arterial trunk can occur also in the presence of intact neural crest cell contributions. And a nice example is shown here. Uh, this is a mouse model where the transcription factor TBX1, which is the major candidate gene for the George syndrome, was deleted in a mouse model, resulting in common arterial trunk. You can nicely see here the separated outflow tract in a wild type and a common arterial trunk in the TBX1 um, deficient mice. And of interest, TBX1 has been shown to be a critical transcriptional regulator of the second heart field development. 
and uh, likely there are uh, signaling pathways between those two cell populations, so the neural crest and the second heart field. Uh, so uh, for those not so familiar with the second heart field, uh, so what do we mean by, by this? So the second heart field is a mesenchymal cell population um, that is situated posterior to the heart during development. So if this is an embryonic uh, schematic overview of the embryo with the head region here and the salomic space here, we see the heart situated uh, here, still a tubular space with those blue neural crest cells. And then in yellow is indicated the second heart field. So this is mesenchyme still that will still be added to the heart during uh, development. And especially the outflow tract will still elongate during development. And we always used to think that that was a symmetrical process as indicated in the middle uh, picture. But uh, well, uh, since, uh, since several decades, we know that the outflow tract is not symmetrical, uh, the myocardium, but it is uh, sort of saddle shaped and it has an, a longer uh, pulmonary uh, outflow tract. Um, and uh, well, from uh, research from animal models has, has shown that if you uh, look at um, the contributions of the second heart field to the outflow tract, uh, we can see here um, we can see here the developing aorta and the pulmonary trunk. This would be the level of the uh, AV uh, canal. And this is then the, the second heart field mesenchyme. We can see that there is more uh, addition of this uh, mesenchymal second heart field population to the pulmonary side of the outflow uh, tract. So um, related to, to, to our work with, uh, with the second heart field is, uh, is the work in the Megalin uh, mouse. So uh, this is another mouse model that has an increased uh, our understanding of common arterial trunk development. And megalin is in fact a lipoprotein receptor protein, but it also acts as receptor in a an retinoic acid and sonic hedgehog pathways. And th those are two pathways that are indispensable in second heart field and neural crest cell differentiation. And uh, well, this is work from several years ago when we studied the effect of megalin knockout on the heart and uh, found different outrotech malformations, including coronal arterial trunk. And again, you can see here the wild type with a separated pulmonary trunk and the aorta in here 3D reconstructed and in a knockout embryo, a common arterial trunk uh, with here the 3D reconstruction. So to finalize the, the part of uh, the embryological part, I would like to show you uh, here the working model uh, that was formulated and uh, Professor Dr. Gittenberger de Groot had a very big uh, um, uh, role in conceptuali conceptualization of this working model um, of uh, common arterial trunk formation from an embryological point of view in this uh, knockout mouse. And uh, on the left, you see a simplified scheme of the heart with in blue the developing uh, pharyngeal arch artery, the six pharyngeal arch arteries that will later contribute to the arterial duct and the pulmonary arteries. Um, and in red, you see the still unseparated outflow tract. Uh, so this would be anterior and this is posterior. And yellow, uh, again, is indicated uh, the second heart field. Uh, and that is located posteriorly, both in the wild type embryo above and in the knockout embryo, in a sort of a mid sagittal location. And what we see is that the second heart field contributes to what we call a so-called flow divider, which is basically a ridge that you can also recognize uh, in the embryo um, in, the, in the midst of the outflow, of the developing outflow uh, trapped, uh, tract initially. Um, and um, you see it in between both pharyngeal arch arteries uh, and the left of which will become the arterial duct. Now, if we look during further normal development, what we see happening in these embryos is that uh, the second heart field, including this flow divider, uh, will, um, will uh, remodel and it will extend and shift more uh, towards the left side. Um, and uh, so the here giving rise here to the left pulmonary outflow tract. And this process is, uh, is quite important because it also makes room for the neural crest cells that will migrate uh, towards the heart uh, in this, uh, in this orchest orchestrated time uh, fashion. Um, and we see that the neural crest cells will migrate to the heart to the right of the second heart field towards the outflow tract cushions that are indicated in light uh, pale blue, and uh, they will contribute to the orthopulmonary septum. So this, this green halter uh, indicates the pulmonary septum that now um, the orthopulmonary septum that is now situated in between the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, with the flow divider still here um, present between the developing pharyngeal arch arteries. So what we saw happening in the uh, megalin knockout mouse is that this remodeling um, 
didn't occur and the flow divider stays in the mid sagittal position. So the remodeling towards the left does not occur and the neural crest cells take or must take in this case a diverted route to the heart, resulting in a mal development or mal positioning of the outflow septum of the uh, orthopulmonary septum and thus resulting in a common arterial trunk. And uh, this is basically, uh, yeah, of course, uh, well, hardcore embryology uh, conceptual um, findings in, in this particular mouse model. Um, uh, and what we could see in this, uh, in this model is that we could also see that the, the different morphologies of pulmonary arteries um, were visible. And uh, that's uh, depending on the amount of division by the flow divider, either with a short stem or with separate uh, ostia. Um, so um, together, um, taken together, these, these anatomical variability will also, of course, we also see that uh, in humans that I will get to later. Um, uh, this uh, anatomical variability also uh, was the basis uh, for the wish of several morphologists and clinicians to develop more systems that could classify uh, different subforms of a common arterial trunk in groups in order to recognize their morphology. And what, what I would like to do in the remainder of this, uh, of this talk is to take you a little bit through this classification of common arterial trunk, which actually has quite a long history and quite some uh, different names of, uh, of morphologists attributed to these different classifications. And we start with the Colleton Edward classification, very well known, um, that was developed in 1949 uh, already. And Colleton Edwards uh, initially defined four types of common arterial trunk. There were actually types one to three that refer to the mode by which the left and right pulmonary arteries arise from the trunk. Uh, so type one with a short, short pulmonary trunk. Yeah, so this would be the, the trunk of valve, short pulmonary trunk, giving rise to the LPA and the RPA. Uh, type two with separate orifices, so no trunk, uh, spaced closely together. And type three, where uh, the orifices are widely spaced. And uh, nowadays, there, uh, there was initially also a type four, but type four we nowadays do not consider a common arterial trunk anymore. So basically, uh, this is the case where both pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary trunk are absent, um, and the pulmonary circulation is supplied completely by orthopulmonary uh, collateral circulation. So this is not, this we, don't, we do not consider a, a trunk anymore. So, uh, well, what does it look like uh, in, a, in, a, in a true human heart? So I would like to take you uh, through several morphological subtypes. And what we see here is Colleton Edwards type one. Um, so I'm going to show you the heart and maybe it's good uh, for those of you not used to looking at those morphological hearts to tell you a little bit about how, you're, how I'm presenting these. So what I will usually do is I will always present the heart from an anterior view. And we usually cut the hearts um, parallel to the ventricular septum. So with two vertical cuts. So when you open the heart, you can get a look either into the right-sided ventricle or in the left-sided ventricle. So that has also been done in this, uh, in this uh, child's uh, heart. So this would be the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and the level of the interventricular septum. And you can see here the level of the outflow tract. And you can already see there's basically one vessel departing from the heart. Uh, and we're going to look a little bit closer later, uh, later on, but we're going to first have a look inside the ventricles. So a look inside to the right ventricle with the tricuspid valve. This is the level of the uh, VSD, usually subarterial. We'll get back to that later. And we have here uh, the left uh, ventricle with here the mitral valve, and the VSD is seen from the left. And we're going to now have a look into the, uh, the pulmonary trunk. So we have here the systemic part of the pulmonary trunk, and uh, the aortic part, recognizable by the aortic arch tributaries, as being probed. And here going towards the descending uh, aorta. And we're going to uh, enter here the pulmonary part of the, of the trunk. And we can see here there's a common orifice that gives rise the access to the left pulmonary artery. But also here, you can see there's only one orifice here, right here. And it also gives rise to the right pulmonary orifice. We can see nicely here a coronary orifice as well. We're also going to have a look inside the, the truncal valve. So if I tilt the heart, we're looking from superior. And we see that there in this case, there's a tricuspid truncal valve. Uh, here. So one common valve to supply the blood to both the systemic and the pulmonary part of the, uh, of the trunk. So uh, let's have a closer look at the VSD for, uh, for, for in this slide. So the VSD is usually an outlet subarterial uh, VSD with a muscular posterior rim. That's the most frequent. You can see the VSD here. So the superior well, rim, as you, uh, if you uh, may, may say, is the truncal valve. 
So anteriorly, the VSD is bordered by the primary uh, part of the ventricular septum, and the posterior uh, rim can either be muscular, which is most common. So that would basically be a continuation of this structure here, the ventricular infidibular fold, towards the trabecula septum marginalis. Um, but it can also be fibrous uh, in, in a, a little bit less common. Uh, and then it's a perimembranous VSD. And in that case, there's a fibrous continuity of the atrial ventricular valves that form part of the posterior inferior rim. So in that case, there's no continuity here, but there's still a, a fibrous uh, attachment of the valve uh, here in the posterior part. We also see quite a common the coronary variations and anomalies, so like uh, about 64% in our own series. And that can have a quite a quite a, a large variability. We can see high takeoff, a single coronary arteries, also a coronary ostia positioned near valve commissures, uh, absent left main or double coronary orifices, but also ectopic positions uh, well above the tubo uh, uh, sinotubular junction. And then is this this picture shows, for instance, the proximity of the coronary artery to the pulmonary artery. And there's well, some more listed here, and we've summarized them all in a, a consensus document that was published last year that we worked on together with, uh, with, with Joanna and, and a working group on, a, on the management of patients with common arterial trunk. So um, if we go back to the classification system of Colleton Edwards, I would now like to show you a type two anatomy. So with, uh, with uh, not a common, um, common part, but a, a separate arising of the LPA and RPA from the, from the common arterial trunk. So again, right and left ventricle in the level of the ventricular septum. This, this, this is the lung that we are going to um, put aside a little bit. We're looking here again at this common, uh, common arterial uh, trunk, only one vessel uh, leaving the heart. And again, a few from the right ventricle. So we see here uh, the, tricuspid, uh, the tricuspid valve and the VSD. And I'm just going to uh, stop the video here for a minute because we see here the left ventricle with the mitral valve. And I also would like you to, would like to indicate, please note this very thick, a myocardial layer, uh, anterior wall of the left ventricle and also of the posterior wall. And you can see that this uh, actually compromises the mitral valve. So you can see the mitral valve is actually sandwiched in between these very thickened muscles uh, of the anterior posterior left ventricular wall. And again, this is the VSD as seen from the uh, left side. So let's have a look at the outflow tract uh, again. So again, the systemic part and the pulmonary part of the, of the trunk can be distinguished. And you can recognize the aortic part by the, by the aortic uh, tributaries. And if we look inside, we're going to have a look at the valve in this case first. It's very nicely seen a bicuspid valve, a bicuspid a truncal valve here in orifice of a coronary artery. And here we can see nicely the closely spaced uh, pulmonary arteries here without a, a truncal part, so a type 2 collagen Edwards. Uh, common arterial trunk. And as we've seen, the valve in this case, in this case was bicuspid, the bicuspid truncal valve that is uh, described in literature in, in about 7 to 8% in our own series. We found slightly higher, or even up to one, one fourth of the, of the hearts with a bicuspid valve. Tricuspid uh, truncal valve is the most common and quite, uh, quite rare are the unicuspid, pentacuspid, and hexacuspid valves really rare, and there are also in some cases up to 20 to 30 percent, there's a quadricuspid valve. So in this meaning that there are four valvular uh, leaflets. So Colleton Edwards um, classification was used for many years, but it did not consider the aortic or pulmonary dominance uh, caused by, for example, obstructive lesions in the aorta or non-confluent uh, pulmonary arteries. And uh, in 1965, uh, the classification was uh, revised by Van Praag. Um, and the, also to include cases with a single pulmonary artery supplying one lung, uh, with arteries arising from the arterial ducts or collateral arteries usually supplying the other lung, so a type A3, um, as well as cases with hypoplasia, coarctation, atresia, or, or an absence of the aortic isthmus. Um, and basically, these were the cases leaving the systemic circulation dependent on supply by a large patent arterial duct. Um, so here we're looking at this, uh, this classification. So basically, type, type 1 and 2 are the same as the original classification, but type, type 3 and 4 uh, also take into account, uh, the, the, for instance, the interruption of the aorta and one missing pulmonary artery. And the A in these subtypes refers to cases with the VSD, which will be the majority of, uh, of cases. So I'll also um, uh, let you have a look at the Van Praag type uh, A3. And this was a case of isomerism of the right uh, atrial appendages. 
Um, so again, we have an anterior view here with a left and a right a ventricle and an interventricular uh, septum. And we can very, very well see those isomeric appendages here and here the common arterial trunk. So we have here the brachiocephalic uh, trunk, first uh, vessel and here the, the carotid uh, artery and the left subclavian uh, artery uh, here and the descending aorta here. So if we look at, uh, at the pulmonary arteries now, we see one branch one posterior branch supplying uh, the right uh, lung. But what, uh, what, what we could not find was a branch uh, supplying uh, the left lung. And um, basically we don't have so much, I, I'm not, not sure this is the best example, but this is at least one heart in which we could uh, find one absent pulmonary artery. And what you do as a morphology is we started looking for a uh, supply to the, to the left lung. So now we're looking from the dorsal. So left is indeed your left hand. And here in the descending aorta, uh, there's an orifice of an, uh, of an artery, and indeed there, there is uh, one, uh, one branch, one collateral blend, branch coming from the descending aorta towards, uh, sort of to supply here, uh, the left lung. So we classified this as a type A3 um, in the Van Praag uh, classification. So a minor simplification of the classification system was made by members of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons um, and the European Associ Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons in 2000, uh, combining type 1A and type uh, A, uh, of A1 and A2 into uh, one single type to, to simplify the system slightly. It was not a major uh, change, but, um, but uh, a substantial change was made uh, later on in 2011. Um, uh, and that was uh, that was a change that uh, that encompassed uh, no, no longer using uh, types one, two, or three, but basically naming two subtypes, uh, so a common arterial trunk either with aortic or with pulmonary dominance. And then the aortic dominant type uh, would have adjacent or nearly adjacent pulmonary arteries from the posterior lateral aspect of the common arterial trunk. And basically, um, a pulmonary dominant type would be. Uh, when the distal systemic circulation uh, is dependent on patency of the arterial duct, so, such as, as encountered in cases of interruption of the aortic arch uh, or coarctation. And um, well, this is also one, one thing that we will hear, I think, also later on from, uh, from the uh, imaging uh, presenters. If a ductus is present, uh, we should study the arch and see what is happening there, that it necess necessitates the ductus to be open. So um, this is the classification by Russell et al., um, and so, well, a final movie to show you um, to show you uh, about this uh, classification. This is a case with pulmonary dominance with an aortic interruption type B. So that means that the interruption of the aorta is uh, is after the um, left carotid artery. So if I uh, start the heart uh, here, we have again the same view with the left and right ventricle and the interventricular septum. Um, and uh, well, we again have one vessel arising from the heart. So if we look inside the right ventricle, this is the same, the same view. And again here, a few from the left, from the left ventricle with the mitral valve. And we're going to have a look um, at, the, um, at the trunk. So we have the common arterial trunk here giving rise to one segment. Um, and this is the area of the interruption. So this is the brachiocephalic trunk and the right, uh, uh, the left carotid artery and then the interruption. And then here we have the, uh, the sorry, the left subclavian artery. So the interruption is between the left carotid and the left subclavian artery. This is the descending aorta. And below here is the arterial duct. So the blood uh, to the descending aorta goes via the arterial ducts right here. It also supplies here the uh, left subclavian. And we can see that the orifices of the pulmonary arteries are situated here. I hope I have them. Those are those two orifices here. So the orifice to the left and the right uh, pulmonary, uh, pulmonary arteries, so below the level of the duct. So an aortic interruption type B with a distal systemic circulation dependent on the arterial uh, duct. So a Russell, et, a Russell et al. classification would just call it a pulmonary uh, dominance. So, um, so if we, uh, well, well, like I said, if you see an open duct, it's important to study the aortic arch and what kind of aortic arch anomalies can we encounter. And we can see a right aortic arch, uh, plus or minus mirror, mirror image branching, interruption of the arch, as we just saw, arch hypoplasia and coarctation, more rarely a double aortic arch, abnormal branching patterns, and uh, also Lusoria uh, arteries. And uh, in general, 
um, these aortic arch anomalies are more prevalent in the 22Q11 deletion syndrome. And I also, uh, in, in some smaller letters, put aortic dilation here. Um, it's not a real anomaly. We consider it for now a possibly a secondary characteristics, possibly also with some intrinsic anomaly of the aortic wall. Um, so um, so the, the Russell et al. system that, that, that describes the, the, the cut as either uh, aortic or pulmonary dominant has advantages. So you can really, uh, yeah, it's congruent with clinical re relevance and it emphasizes the key morphological determinants of surgical outcome. Um, but, uh, but it's also very simple. So it does necessitate an additional description of anatomy, such as details on the pulmonary arteries and other associated anomalies. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot of those anomalies in the remainder of the session. So I've summarized some of them uh, here. So basically, this brings me to the, to the end of my, my presentation. And I would like to thank my, uh, my dear colleagues in Leiden for the great collaboration, especially, of course, uh, my mentors, uh, Margot Barteling uh, and uh, Adriana Gittenberger de Groot, who unfortunately uh, passed away in 2020 and who inspired so many of us uh, for many years. And she left a great legacy in the research uh, she devoted her life on. And to finally, uh, also my, my daughter Emma filmed all those uh, beautiful hearts with me. So I also want to uh, acknowledge her. Thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Monique. That was spectacular and uh, quite encyclopedic, in fact. Uh, and I forgot uh, Dr. Hassenkamp, uh, the paper that he published uh, with you as a co-author. And I think that you put uh, the whole description very clearly. I would just like to say a, a couple of things. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that I think that uh, a real advance has been made by um, <clears throat> the um, people. I'd like to share my screen, if I may. Uh, just let me see if I can do that. Share the screen. Um, the host will probably let me do that. Um, I'll just uh, make a little commercial. I have a, a paper out here in, um, uh, in the, the Congenital Heart Academy we have, I've discussed the echopathological correlations of transposition. Uh, I don't know whether you can see this, but here it is. And the, uh, the website for getting to this is www.md1world.com. And there's uh, pretty much the same sort of uh, collection of specimens, but I think uh, also very nice and worthwhile for looking at. I think the most important issue, um, I still have to share my screen again. The most important um, uh, issue here is to talk about this rationalizing the nomenclature of common arterial trunk. And I think that, uh, that this paper by Dr. Marshall Jacobs and Bob Anderson, uh, published again in the Cardiology in the Young, uh, and uh, relates to the work of Russell on classifying the structures into just two simple types. And the advantage of doing that is that uh, there are a number of issues that are important in terms of the classification. And the, the classification, if I can just, uh, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Let me just give you this picture over here, which I think is the bottom line. There we go is you can classify the trunk, common arterial trunk, into two separate types, as you showed with Russell. I think this is a very nice diagram. <clears throat> there is the pulmonary dominant, which you see here, where, as you showed on your specimen, the aorta arises almost as a, um, a, 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 an afterthought of the common trunk. And it's small, almost looks like a hyperplast. And in fact, Sometimes the diagnosis is uh, misconstrued because they uh, think that this is really uh, a, uh, a hyperplast when it really is a trunk. And in utero, this is a difficult uh, um, condition to, to see. So in the pulmonary dominant, the aorta is small and is interrupted usually between the uh, uh, left carotid and left subclavian arteries. And this is the difficult area to, to identify. Now, what is the other reason for making this differential is the prognosis and the treatment of this condition is much worse than the aortic dominant, 
where here is the aortic dominant variety. And so uh, it, it is important in a number of uh, places to make it. It's also much easier to make this diagnosis and this missing of the interrupted aortic arch in utero is a problem. So those are the only two things that I have to say. I thought your presentation was really quite spectacular and I've uh, saved all of the pictures. And I think that for the benefit of the participants here, uh, this uh, um, um, whole recording will be um, uh, put up on the Congenital Heart Academy website and we'll be able to look at you again and again. Uh, let's see, are there any questions? There, I don't see any questions uh, on this over here. So in that case, let us move on to uh, the next talk. And the next talk is given by my very good friend, Dr. Joanna Dangle, Professor Joanna Dangle, who's uh, the head of uh, the fetal center uh, at, uh, for postgraduate uh, med post medical education in Warsaw, Poland, and certainly um, one of the great uh, um, uh, fetal cardiologists uh, in the world today. And she's going to talk about the crucial issues in the prenatal diagnosis. Joanna, let me stop sharing my screen. And oh, I've stopped. And uh, can you share your screen and begin yeah. your presentation? Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Uh, okay, thank you, Norma, very, very much for such a kind invitation. And first of all, I would like to, to thank Rima and the whole Congenital Heart Academy that they invited us uh, to share our knowledge with the uh, audience. Uh, common arterial trunk is the fascinating lesion when we are uh, thinking about the uh, fetal life as uh, in effect, it is not very easy uh, to be diagnosed. Uh, I have no disclosure. And then uh, we should start from the screening because this is what I did in Poland and I think it happened every, uh, everywhere in the world. Uh, we started to have more and more fetal heart defects uh, uh, from the time when we taught uh, obstetricians how to look at the fetal cardiovascular system. So in the screening, the first... Uh, uh, clue for diagnosis of the any kind of truncal defect and especially common arterial trunk is the cardiac angle, which in the trunk is uh, close to 90 degrees. Then we are looking for the full chamber, which is looks entirely normal apart from this very hard left axis deviation. And then we are moving to the mediastinum and this mediastinum is quite typical. However, it can be missed for the tetralogy of fallow with very high poplastic pulmonary arteries. What is important for the obstetrician and fetal cardiologist as well, we have to look at the thymus. So the first thing we have to look how far from the anterior part of the, ch of the chest is, uh, are the vessels, and here are very close to the anterior wall. So the uh, hypoplastic thymus is very, very likely. So screening, unfortunately, is just the beginning of the final diagnosis. So as we wrote those questions in our uh, consensus document, we have to ask ourselves uh, some questions. How to distinguish between the common arterial trunk and tetralogy of follow with pulmonary atresia? It is easy after birth. It is quite complicated before. Uh, what to look at the full chamber view apart from the angle? Are there any other clues like in transposition uh, with the bidirection flow in the um, foramen ovale? Uh, if any genetic and if, uh, what kind of genetic tests should be performed? What are info, uh, in <coughs> important informations for the parents? And what informations are necessary for the peri perinatal management? And all those questions should be answered before delivery. 
Diagnosis can be established early. This is a very, very old study. The study was performed in 15 weeks of gestation because mother had the previous baby with the common arterial trunk. Uh, we can see uh, full chamber, not very well, but certainly it is full chamber view with high angle and the, uh, the apex is down and just one vessel is uh, going up, as you can see here with quite high, uh, uh, with normal velocity. In this part, we of course couldn't distinguish between the pulmonary atresia and common arterial trunk. Let's uh, show the examples. Uh, it was 30 year old uh, uh, lady and her first pregnancy was two years earlier, and uh, it was diagnosed of interruption aortic arch and the George syndrome. And due to this, uh, the uh, mother was uh, tested, and she had the George syndrome as well, which she didn't know until she was 30. Uh, this baby was born in 32 weeks of gestation and unfortunately died because couldn't be operated on. So the decision before the second pregnancy, knowing that the mother had the George syndrome was the pre-implantation genetic test, and it appears to be normal. So she was sure that the normal embryo was implant implanted. However, in 15 weeks of gestation, she came to my unit, and then we see the not completely normal full chamber with the left axis. <coughs> We can see nicely developed both ventricles, and we can see just one vessel arising uh, over the VSD with not very, with slight insufficiency of this uh, valve. And here we can see, uh, remember, this is 15 weeks of gestation, the most probably the dominant aorta, and most probably just over the trunk. Uh, short uh, pulmonary trunk with the pulmonary arteries. It was like <coughs> so at that time. In 23 weeks, this uh, uh, picture was uh, much better. Uh, the valve, which we thought it was truncal valve, was not uh, very bad. Uh, and uh, we can see here something like the uh, pulmonary arteries arising just over the valve. Uh, so then we put the diagnosis of common arterial trunk. However, ex post, when we're looking for the aortic arch, here we can see some vessels, which can be, of course, uh, uh, the uh, main uh, aorta pulmonary collaterals, which we missed during this exam. Uh, you can imagine how difficult the consultation with the mother was, who was sure that she's going to have the normal baby. And uh, basing on this exam with uh, no thymus, with this kind of anatomy, we were almost sure that this baby will have the George syndrome as well, but the mother refused to do genetics test before, uh, before birth. The baby boy was born in 30 weeks of gestation, unfortunately a bit earlier due to polyhydramnios. Uh, the weight was 2,400 grams, and diagnosis was pulmonary atresia VSD with hypoplastic pulmonary arteries. So those small arteries we saw, they were in fact the pulmonary arteries, which was filled mainly uh, through the uh, collaterals because it was not really very big uh, or even small arterial duct. And the baby was confirmed with the George syndrome as well. So once more, we should ask ourselves the questions, why pre-implantation diagnosis was wrong and why the prenatal diagnosis was common arterial trunk and not pulmonary attrition. So I would like just to mm, show you some very, very similar pictures. When you look at this picture and this picture without the color, they looked very, very similar. When you look at this picture, you can see that the aorta and pulmonary artery are filled in different colors. So we should assume that the pulmonary arteries are filled retrogradely through the arterial duct. Uh, whereas in this uh, picture, you can see uh, similar pulmonary artery. However, they looked a bit different, as you can see, 
and they are fed the same color as the aorta. So this is the first thing we should really see very careful when we have the uh, anatomy like this. Uh, then uh, we should really look at the direction of flow once more. The retrograde uh, the filling of the pulmonary artery with quite turbulent flow, uh, we can see uh, here. And then, of course, it's turbulent flow backward. And then, of course, uh, uh, the uh, flow is towards the lungs. And here is the common arterial trunk. And then we can see that the through the uh, uh, truncal valve, uh, the blood is going to the aorta and to the short truncus and both pulmonary arteries. So it is different, but it is different when we know that really this is diagnosis of the trunk or pulmonary atresia. But during the exam, it is not uh, very easy. Uh, so just basing on the, our, um, unfortunately, still unpublished uh, uh, data, now published are the trilogy of follow, but unpublished are the, our material about the common arterial trunk. Uh, in all three, on all both collisions, we have abnormal cardiac axis, sub subarterial um, BSD, and one vessel overriding BSD, majority of people said, oh, this is the aorta, and of course, we don't know if it's really the aorta. Uh, in the common arterial trunk, uh, more common the aorta uh, uh, dominantly uh, came from the right ventricle, not just entirely over the BSD. And of course, in the pulmonary atresia, we should have reverse flow through the ductus arteriosus in the mediastinum. We should see the confluent narrow pulmonary arteries, uh, and uh, we can find uh, uh, collaterals, not always, but we should uh, search for them in both of those uh, uh, lesions. Uh, in uh, uh, in uh, common trunk, uh, we should look at the uh, valve because if we have the insufficiency and slightly dysplastic valve, uh, it uh, most probably is the truncal valve. So I think that it was the main reason that we mixed both diagnosis in this previous case because it was for the whole the pregnancy, it was not big, but slight insufficiency of the truncal valve, of the uh, arterial valve, which is quite unusual for the tetralogy of follow. Uh, usually the velocity is higher than in the, um, the tetralogy of follow on the aorta, and size of the arterial valve is always uh, more than a plus three zit score, so it is bigger than the aorta. So these are just simple clues how we can distinguish in prenatal period the uh, pulmonary atresia from a common arterial trunk. So now uh, a few examples. Uh, once more, the truncus uh, and uh, nicely uh, developed uh, pulmonary arteries. In 24 weeks, uh, we can see certainly one pulmonary artery, but we don't see the other one. So we should search for this other one pulmonary artery. It shouldn't be like this in the uh, um, tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, and then when we are going from uh, the four chamber view to the mediastinum, uh, in contrary to the previous cases, in this case, we can see nicely uh, developed uh, a thymus. And here is nicely developed thymus. So the risk that it will be the, um, the George syndrome is fortunately uh, very, very low. And as we can see, the velocity in the, uh, through the truncal valve is almost 1.5 meter per second, which is quite high. We can see nicely uh, uh, coming from uh, the uh, tr truncus, uh, the left uh, pulmonary artery. <coughs> you can't see the right pulmonary artery. We can reconstruct this, and in the reconstruction, we can see uh, that this truncal valve is not very bad. And of course, the uh, full chamber view is, looks entirely normal because in the real full chamber, we don't see the VSD, which is more anteriorly. Uh, 
Uh, then we have to remember uh, that um, trunkal, uh, trunkal valve can deteriorate its function during, uh, uh, during gestation. Uh, and here we can see very, very dysplastic trunkal valve. Uh, in 22 weeks of gestation, it is 1.5 meter per, per second, so not very bad, and without insufficiency. So we hope maybe it will be possible to repair this. Uh, unfortunately, in 36 weeks of gestation, we have already more than two meter per second, the velocity through the truncal valve, and not severe, but uh, rather mild insufficiency, but we must remember that just after birth, both uh, stenosis and special insufficiency uh, can deteriorate uh, due to the fact that the, um, this valve should uh, lead the uh, flow uh, against uh, the much uh, higher resistance than during the fetal life. So we must remember that such this plastic valve can really cause severe neonatal insufficiency. Uh, how it was, uh, uh, it is important to know that the uh, fetal series are different than the surgical series because many fetuses just do not survive uh, to delivery and some of them don't, su don't survive until operation. Uh, this is the work from 203. 23 cases of uh, arterial uh, tr uh, trunk, about one third termination of pregnancy. Uh, 13, uh, uh, thir 13 uh, they were live birth uh, uh, babies, and just uh, five cases survived the operation. So we must remember that when we diagnose common arterial trunk early in pregnancy, we really don't know the outcome and we should rely on the fetal series, not surgical series. However, we of course should tell which kind of uh, common trunk can be operated on and which can't be operated on. Uh, of course, Monique uh, showed those beautiful uh, simplified categorization and I like this and I uh, fully agree with Monique who said that we should describe what we see not just say that it is type one, two, three, four, according to the classification, this and that, but just say that this is common arterial trunk, the dominant pulmonary artery or the aorta, and then we can see both pulmonary artery are rising together, or can we see them, or how big is the arch, is it left arch, right arch, and always in my unit, we try to describe it quite precisely. And then we have a type two a common arterial trunk, uh, quite interesting because here we can see that this is just the pulmonary artery and we can worry that this is the dominant pulmonary uh, arterial trunk, but it is not the case. This is the uh, truncal valve. And in fact, that this is the aortic arch, which is coming there and from the both sides they are coming, rising to quite well developed pulmonary arteries. It looks quite nice, but not having the even short pulmonary trunk, of course, it will make uh, the surgeons more work than in the other type of, uh, uh, of the trunks. Uh, in 29 weeks, we can uh, see uh, once more. Uh, it is the interesting uh, situation because we can see aortic arch, however, we know that it is truncus, but here from one pulmonary uh, branch of the pulmonary artery, there is uh, the small duct as well. It was quite um, strange findings. Uh, then of course, the uh, much more complicated situation and uh, uh, this which we should know before uh, delivery because in majority of cases, common arterial trunk is not uh, doctor-dependent lesion. Uh, once more, um, close to normal uh, for chamber view. However, the heart is a bit bigger <coughs> than it should be. Uh, unfortunately, quite dysplastic uh, truncal valve, uh, high 
and now we have to think if it is uh, aorta or is it pulmonary artery and in this case this is the uh, pulmonary artery and this small vessel here coming it is the uh, aortic arch which is uh, interrupted so this is one of the most difficult uh, case which i thought that is uh, the lethal disorder because it was severely dysplastic valve and very narrow uh, uh, ascending out and quite a uh, big distance between this interrupted arch and the uh, lower part and the descending out. Um, uh, then uh, the uh, uh, much better uh, case than the previous one. This is the common arterial trunk, one small normal four chamber view uh, with the uh, interrupted aortic, uh, aortic arch. And fortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, good truncal valve. Here we can see, of course, in this uh, view, we must think is it the aortic arch? or is it the ductal arch? Uh, so most probably this is the ductal arch because we do not see the uh, head vessels. Uh, and I think that it is just the picture like uh, this scheme here. Uh, this is the trunk, this is the ductal arch, and this, this is the interrupted arch, just uh, uh, two uh, head vessels arising uh, from, uh, from the common arterial trunk. Of course, very, very uh, difficult uh, case uh, to be operated on. Uh, so what should we know from fetal echocardiography uh, to make the best counseling? Uh, we should, First of all, now, of course, the kind of the, uh, of the truncus, but then the crucial thing is the morphology of the truncal valve, uh, because it is crucial for the development and neonatal outcome, as this plastic truncal valve with severe stenosis and special insufficiency, uh, according to my knowledge, had a very, very bad outcome. Uh, and then most very important uh, situation is to know if it is ductal dependent or no lesion. The ductal dependent will be if we have the interrupted aortic arch. Then of course, uh, genetic is very important. Uh, prevalence, uh, uh, as you see, is not very common. However, in our units, it is common. Recurrences is about six to 7% genetic problems. Uh, a bit more than about one third of the patients with common arterial trunk had the George syndrome, but they are GATA4, GATA6, uh, and rarely trisomy 13 or trisomy 21. These are just occasionally uh, findings. And I will show you quite interesting study of one family mother. Uh, it was uh, many years ago when I met this mother who came for fetal echocardiography because she was operated on due to ASD secundum. The first son had a tricuspid atresia and uh, died uh, somewhere after Glenn operation. It was good tricuspid atresia with nicely developed pulmonary arteries. It was spontaneous abortion in second and third pregnancy and in both pregnancy after um, IVF, it was female fetus, and in 16 weeks of gestation, uh, common trunk with good truncal valve, well-developed pulmonary arteries, and normal genetics uh, with excluded George was uh, established. Uh, the baby girl was born in a good general condition and was really in good condition for eight, day, eight, eight days and died suddenly in the eight days of life resuscitation, just the heart didn't respond for any resuscitation. And uh, in the autopsy, it was congenital pancreas aplasia. Then the mother uh, had MRI, and it appears to be that she had the partial regenesis of the pancreas. And then because it was DNI of both babies, uh, it was the mutation of gate 6 gene, and uh, it was in the mother and both kids. So we must remember that if we have the familiar cases, 
we should search not only microarray, but probably more profound genetic uh, exams. Uh, so during counseling, especially in early pregnancy, we must, we can't be very optimistic. We shouldn't be very pessimistic, but we can't be very optimistic, like in this case, when we have quite well uh, developed uh, very slight insufficiency of the tricuspid valve. Uh, unfortunately, we have the um, frontal valve dysplasia. Uh, Suspicion of the not uh, perfect uh, flow in the um, uh, ductus arteriosus, quite high velocity across the truncal uh, valve and uh, quite high velocity of the um, tricuspid insufficiency for 21 weeks of gestation. Truncal valve is more than four meters per second. So unfortunately we were thinking that it is likely that uh, the uh, circulatory insufficiency will uh, be profound in a few weeks. Then uh, in 24 weeks, we can see severe tricuspid insufficiency, much bigger than in 21 weeks, much worse inflow through both uh, AV valves, abnormal flow, completely abnormal flow in the ductus, artery, in the ductus venosus, and we already see the ascites and the uh, slight uh, pulsation in the uh, vein. And then in 29 week, we had almost not contracting heart, huge ascites, and the subcutaneous uh, tissue edema very, very severely uh, developed, uh, severely dysplastic truncal valve. Uh, completely abnormal flow everywhere, and uh, cardiovascular profile score 3.10. So in such situation, we know that delivering the baby uh, will cause the death of the baby. So we uh, counsel this pa patient uh, that it is really very severe uh, valve, truncal valve uh, stenosis, uh, uh, which gradual deterioration and in 29 weeks, uh, we uh, counseled those parents that it was the lethal condition. So we established perinatal palliative code. We were searching for new syndrome of the mother and the baby died in utero three weeks later. The mother had full psychological support and bereavement support after the death of the baby, according to our standards of um, perinatal palliative care, which uh, 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 which uh, which uh, uh, which is which are available on this web page. Uh, so when the uh, common arterial trunk is diagnosed in the fetus, we have to evaluate the cardiac function, truncal valve function, morphology, and we must remember about genetics. Through, uh, during counseling, we must uh, check the cardiovascular profile score. Uh, because uh, according to this, we know what can be the outcome of the baby. Uh, we must remember, especially in area pregnancy, that the truncal valve can deteriorate and the fetus can be in a very bad condition, like I showed you. Uh, follow up, we must uh, think how often we should perform fetal echo. We usually do it every four to six weeks. Uh, we should have the perinatal uh, plan, so uh, predict the neonatal condition and type of uh, common arterial trunk to give the uh, recommendation if uh, what kind of treatment should receive the baby. And of course, it is possible of termination of pregnancy according to the uh, national law. And in the follow, uh, I just we should know uh, the long uh, term follow up uh, uh, of uh, uh, common anterior trunk repairing. And I must say that from Canada and Australia, uh, those neonates uh, were uh, the results were really good. But I think that we can't rely just on this counseling the uh, fetal arterial trunk because some of them just cannot survive until they will be operated on. So in conclusions, 
we can make a quite precise diagnosis of common arterial crime. However, uh, sometimes the distinguish between the common trunk and pulmonary atresia is quite yes. difficult. It enables to plant the perinatal ingredient. We must remember about the genetic testing, uh, at least microarray, but at the moment, especially in the second pregnancy, we think about doing the more um, advanced genetic tests. Uh, from my point of view, and I reviewed all our cases, uh, none of the babies with, with severely dysplastic trunk valve survived. So I think that it's uh, unfortunately lethal disorder, uh, it deteriorate during pregnancy and the situation of the uh, fetal high drops can be dangerous for uh, the mother. So we have to uh, be in touch with our obstetricians and remember about mirror syndrome. And uh, prenatal and prenatal uh, follow up and long term follow up should must be known while counseling the parents expecting the baby with a common arterial trunk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Joanna. I'm I'm sorry. Um, uh, I I joined late. Do you hear me? Yes. Um, thank you so much. We had, a, we had a sick patient in the hospital, and it's beautiful as usual. Um, uh, I have a question which was a bit confusing to me and uh, Dr. Silverman is there. Ductal dependent circulation in cat. Yes, we have ductal dependent circulation. I mean, if it is really ductal dependent, uh, I always uh, wonder because uh, we have, of course, common arterial trunk and the very huge ductal arteriosus, which is leading from the trunk to the descending aorta. So really, is that the risk that, that these uh, uh, ductus will close? I don't know, but theoretically, this is the ductal tissue, not the normal tissue. I think that it is like this. Maybe Monique can tell us something about that. Is it the, we were taught that um, most of the time, usually with CAD, there's no ductus morphologically, right? Yes, but I'm talking about the common arterial trunk with interrupted aortic arch. Oh, I see, with interrupted. Yes, well, so no, 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 it is yeah. no, if we have the dominant pulmonary artery, uh, dominant aorta, of course, there is no duct. I'm talking about the uh, about specific category. rare cases okay. when we have common trunk interrupted arch. So I assume that the uh, connection between the trunk and the descending aorta is the ductus. So theoretically- so with, every, with every coarctation, we expect a duct in, in, in cat. Do we uh, expect a duct with every coarctation in common arterial trunk? Not coarctation, but uh, interrupted arch. We don't or interrupted coarctation. severe coarctation mm -hmm. versus interruption. I think that, uh, that that's true that most of the time in common arterial trunk, when you find an arterial duct, it points towards a pulmonary dominant type of truncus. On the other hand, uh, I have a series of patients where there is an arterial duct found in a number of patients with a common arterial trunk without other associations. And I think we should look at the arterial duct in all of these conotruncal abnormalities because we know, for example, that uh, a tech absent pulmonary valve is, was touted to be a condition where there was con always a congenital absence of the ductus, and that's not the case. And we also know from a recent work published by Mascatia as an abstract that about 20% of tetralogies don't actually have an arterial duct in utero. So I think that the fact of an absent duct or the presence of the duct is certainly a problem in these conditions. And I think we have to be careful about saying, oh, if it's a duct and the arch is intact, that this couldn't be a common arterial trunk. It may well be. Um, so, Monique, Joanna, Monique I, could you kindly comment? Uh, hi, yeah, Monique, I didn't meet before. I didn't greet you. Sorry for being late. Yes. No, no, that's 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 fine. No, I, I must say I, I I agree with Dr. Silverman, and I tried to look up um, a paper of Ariana that she once published. I couldn't find it this quickly, 
So I, I, I think the general message is if you see a duct, study the arch because something may be going on. And something I remember from the work of Ariana is that I think at some point she might see a duct, but it could also during development uh, disappear and later on not be not be present. So there might have been initially, um, yeah, it might have been present, but I'm, I must say that I am not, um, I'm an adult consultant cardiologist and I never see this in the clinic. So I must say I'm not very um, well informed and I must say I agree with Dr. Silverman. Uh, well, me. Joanna said they don't make it right? most of the time, so you wouldn't see them most of, until you come from Australia where they had very good results. Uh, Rika, what do you think? Regarding duct, so we yeah, have, yeah we have a duct in, in the pulmonary dominant form and it's absolutely mandatory. Uh, so if the so this is the first thing. The second thing is sometimes in these forms we also have autopulmonary collaterals to Pulmonary, pulmonary arteries, which is also um, so uh, not usual, but this can also happen. So we have to very careful uh, assess uh, the neonate with or the fetus with complex uh, forms, not type uh, A1 or type two, type A2. So if it goes to A3 uh, um, or let's say. Um, pulmonary uh, um, uh, type uh, cat, we have to be very careful. Look for any so, so simply, simply, Rika, simply, we try to understand and teach uh, ourselves and the others. You're talking about the um, uh, cat with problems in the attachment of pulmonary arteries, or you're talking about the cat with the interruption, because Joanna was saying that with interruption, you expect to have a duct morphologically as part of the uh, CAT and, and interrupted uh, aortic arch. Now you're, you're pointing towards the abnormal and uh, pulmonary anatomy. So which is which now? So you have to have a duct in type in the pulmonary um, uh, uh, um, uh, dominant type. You have to have a duct, but you can have a duct in uh, the aortic dominant form, which former has been called type A3. Then in these forms, one of the pulmonary arteries is arising from the ascending aorta, and one can arise from the descending aorta or can, uh, or can arise from the, uh, um, uh, from the aortic arch, and then there can be abnormalities. Yeah. yeah, Monique, Monique and, and Dr. Silverman, how would you explain that? Now, when we go with the interruption, then the morphology would not go with cat, would go with interruption and they have an arch. And when we go with morphology where the pulmonary arteries are not connected like uh, pulmonary tree, I mean, severe form of fallow pulmonary trees, yeah, you expect an, uh, you expect then a duct. And so where is the, uh, where is the morphology uh, uh, tell us what's going to happen. Is it this, the cat that is guiding us or the specific anatomy, whether it's the arch or the pulmonary arteries? No, I, I think that uh, you, as uh, um, Ulrike has told us now, I mean, in the pulmonary dominant forms and in the type where there is a one pulmonary artery isolated from the aorta, there's usually a ductus present. So the argument really is what happens. It's like pulmonary atresia, Dr. Silverman. We're talking about it's like pulmonary. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm just asking, is this like pulmonary atresia? I know that the beginning of the trunk is different, but we have no, a very I don't, good, so. I, don't, I don't think so. But and I think that what we need for the audience here is to tell them that you can have a type one truncus, and in the rare cases, there will be an arterial duct. Mm -hmm. okay. Why? is probably related uh, as uh, uh, Monique had talked about, is the second heart field, that this is an abnormality yeah. of second heart field development, and the duct is part of second heart field. And so the expression may be somewhat greater than uh, we are commonly ascribe to um, common arterial trunk, but it's, it's a, um, a, 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 a nebulous condition and we don't understand all of the nature of the uh, transcription factors and the migration of the second heart field uh, uh, cells into the uh, 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 arch arteries. And in fact, uh, the, um, 
the um, a pulmonary dominant form of common arterial trunk is an arch abnormality primarily uh, mm. in addition to what you see at the trunk. And it's I, an I ascending, think, ascending aorta abnormality, not an arch abnormality, I think. I think you shouldn't worry about that, uh, but I do think that... Well, I, I'm also to... afraid that we are sort of interpreting because, uh, uh, to be quite honest, I, I did not give a uh, developmental examination to, to either the presence or absence of a duct. I, I think we, we still know too little about it. I think what, what everybody agrees upon is that you, if you have a duct dominant, if you have a, a duct that's feeding the descending aorta, then you should be aware of aortic anomalies. I think we all also agree that there can be a duct even in a non uh, dominant uh, pulmonary dominant circulation, such as in the in the A3 uh, situation. And I think we are just learning a little bit about uh, the developmental uh, aspects. And I wouldn't dare, for my knowledge at least, to say that I can exactly explain why why a duct would or would develop or not in in other cases. So yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a question from the audience. Just of a minute, uh, Rima, Rima, okay. you took over from me without even asking me. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't mind rescuing you. Um, it's a real pleasure and an honor to do that. But Thank I you. Think, Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Dangle, Professor Dangle, on a, on a spectacular talk. And there's a question here that the audience uh, needs to answer. And that's the question of whether you should do a, a consider a, um, a cesarean section in cases of... Uh, common arterial trunk. It's uh, from Oscar Swetsak, I think. I don't know how you pronounce that name, or maybe you do. Um, my Polish is very poor. Oscar Silvestrak. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe you okay, can... I can answer this, because yes. I don't see any point uh, to do cesarean section, in effect, in any congenital heart defects. Uh, and our policy is that uh, we just ask the mother to be close to the place when she delivers. They are, of course, uh, under obstetrician care, and they said, okay, like in normal delivery, especially that we know that a majority of cases in the common arterial trunk, those babies will be in a good condition. And generally, they are uh, in better condition when they will deliver just naturally at time when they wanted to be delivered, let's say like this. And uh, our policy in our unit and around Warsaw is not to do the plant cesarean section in any congenital heart defects, apart from very, very rare cases when we have to organize everything. But even if we suspect the restriction uh, of foramen ovale in transposition, our obstetricians can uh, induce the labor uh, to deliver the baby in the morning. And in the common trunk, if there are any obstetric reasons or maternal reasons, of course, but not from the side of the baby. Yeah. Um, Can I, I add to... one thing, Dr. Silverman? Would you allow me to add one thing? Yeah, I want to. I want to add one thing because I think okay. that uh, you have to consider the the audience here, and I think that uh, you highlighted very clearly for us, uh, Joanna, the difficulty to make the diagnosis sometimes between tetralogy and truncus. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and of course. There are some other pointers. For example, I think if you have aortic insufficiency, if you find that, it's much more likely to be a common arterial trunk. Because in tetralogy, the valve is usually okay. The other thing is to look for the monology of Stenson. You know, Nyla Stenson, 150 years before Fallot, described in a fetus, in an abortus, a, 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 in the case of tetralogy, he said there was only one abnormality, and that was the anterior and superior deviation of the outlet septum. And I think that when you differentiate tetralogy from truncus, you need to look at the outlet septum. But in the end, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult diagnosis to make. And I think uh, uh, you highlighted it very well, but it's something that, you know, the audience needs to uh, consider. Now, Rima, you can talk. I just want to thank Dr. Silverman for rescuing me today because uh, I mean, 
for starting the uh, webinar. Thank you again. He's our he's our master. Now, I just want to add one thing uh, which is learned with the cardiovascular profile score. In the case you presented, the score was three. So what I've learned from Dr. Hutch is that anything below seven is usually um, heart failure and this is an indication for cesarean. Joanna, do you agree to that? Because most of the obstetricians ask um, generally about congenital heart disease if, um, and the advice is that uh, delivery at term and assisted delivery from the cardiac point of view. But I would always add the score. Do you agree to that? No, I mean, uh, when I show you this uh, case, it was 29 weeks of gestation. It was severe high drops and uh, the heart was not contracting at all. So it was the liver disorder. So what was the point to do the cesarean for the baby who will die in the first or second minutes of life? Then we really, it was quite hard work for me, I must say. Of course, nobody of us likes to say, this baby is not going to survive. But because my husband established the palliative care for children in Poland, and he developed this uh, very difficult uh, uh, specialization, let's say. And then I know that more and more um, palliative, palliative care in uh, hospital palliative care are in many hospitals in the States because I'm searching for this. So we established the perinatal palliative care for fetuses. And I think that it's just unethical to do this cesarean section for the baby who is going to die just after delivery. So I am against it and I don't see the point. And then we can let the baby die in utero. And we did this. And then this lady delivered uh, normally, yes, vaginally, and then she can have the normal baby in one or two years uh, without having the scar after cesarean section. Sure. Of course, if from the obstetrics point of view, it wouldn't be possible to deliver the baby due to hydrox, then they have to uh, decide if this baby can be uh, delivered vaginally or not, but it was the small baby, so it wasn't a problem. And this is our policy about when we have, uh, uh, of course, we can, uh, we can disagree that uh, we could uh, try to rescue this baby, but I didn't see the uh, real chance for these fetus. So then, and I know that any fetus who, and we did, of course, the situation like this, for instance, with babies with complete heart block, and they were born uh, early, I mean, around 30 weeks of gestation uh, with high drops, and we thought that it would be better to deliver them by CC and then try to treat them, all of them died. So then having those um, experience, I know that anybody, any fetus who uh, would be born uh, and having CVPS score below five and especially below four, they will die uh, nevertheless if we deliver them or let them die in utero. This is I, my experience. I, yeah, I think that uh, the, uh, I would say the opposite of what uh, Rima said. Uh, if, if I, didn't we, say, I didn't say, let me just clarify. I didn't say this baby should go for cesarean. What I'm saying, we should consider the score in our decision, that's all. Of course, somebody with a poor contractility, I wouldn't send him for cesarean even 29 weeks with high drops. I'm just saying in our decision, um, that will help just to see the score uh, as part of the plan, that's all. I think that's, that's right. Uh, on the other hand, I would think that the babies with a score of greater than seven of the viable babies, and those are the ones you want to consider every means of delivery and the fortunate thing about this is that uh, most of the time the delivery decisions are made by obstetricians and so we aren't really involved we can give them our opinion I, I we must move on but i want to ask joanna just one last question because she mentioned of course the um 22 q11 minus syndrome mm -hmm. but the i found a number of these patients and your 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 slide did show that there was um, chromosomal abnormalities. What's your standard policy with common arterial trunk in terms of genetic evaluation? Do you do whole exome sequencing? Do you do just uh, the um, 
soluble maternal DNA? What what do you do? No, we uh, uh, we always try to um, uh, try to uh, convince the, the parents that they should have the invasive tests. Yeah. And uh, generally, we do microarray, uh, yeah. and uh, it, it is quite difficult in my country to do uh, all those uh, whole genomics yes. because uh, they are quite uh, expensive. expensive study. But uh, if the parents would like to know, at the moment we have the grant that if they are cancelled prenatally and everything is normal, and we suspect that it can be important for the future of this family, they can have the more profound test, but it is not as a routine. As a routine, we are doing uh, microarray invasive tests, and I try to avoid the maternal DNA in cases when, we, when I diagnose a defect which with high risk of uh, uh, with high risk uh, of genetics uh, problems, because in, in Francas we can suspect that it will be about one third of them will have the genetic problems, yes. So, That's and right. then when we do a DNA, uh, it is still the screening test, yes. So in fact, we should uh, uh, prove this by the normal karyotype. So I, I, I'm counseling those pa patients like this that, I think that 99% of them decided to, uh, to do amniocentesis. Yeah. I think we have to move on now because uh, uh, this is a wonderful discussion, uh, but unfortunately we have to provide uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Herberg with an opportunity to present her data. And uh, we're probably gonna have some more discussion after that. Yeah. So um, I'll let uh, Rima uh, do the introduction because she's so eloquent. And I'll let you do that, Rima, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Silverman. Uh, uh, just let us introduce uh, uh, Rika Herberg, Professor of Pediatric Cardiology and Head of Department in University of Bonn, a very active member. And she's been our uh, host many, many times in many occasions. Thank you, Rika, for accepting the invitation. Dear Rima, dear Dr. Silverman, thank you for what, so much for your kind invitation to this webinar. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk about the perinatal challenges and postnatal treatment in common arterial trunk. First, I want to start with a typical case. Uh, a, a small uh, baby recently born in our department. It's the fourth uh, child of a 34 years old lady with gestational diabetes and common arterial trunk was diagnosed in the 17th plus two weeks of gestation. The baby was born in the 35 plus one weeks of gestation due to interuterine growth retardation with a very low birth weight and length below the third percentile. Now we are looking at the echocardiographic data on the left upper uh, part of the screen, you are able to see the parasternal long axis with the left ventricle, right ventricle, the VSD, and the typical findings of a truncal valve, in this case, overriding the VSD. But you can also see very close to the left atrium, this round area, which is this coronary sinus, which is in this case, the sign for left persistent vena cava. If we go further down here in the slide, we do see a kind of five chamber view. And this is the left and right ventricle, the VSD, and we see the opening of the valve with a moderate flow propagation and the continuous uh, uh, aorta ascendance or uh, uh, truncal as and aorta ascendance uh, um, part and also the small, um, probably common uh, part of the pulmonary artery and the left, right and left pulmonary artery. If we then look at the short axis in this case, 
of the truncal valve. So if we cut the truncal valve like in this position, we are able to see the truncal valve as well as the right and left pulmonary artery. And we see that there is not a common part of the pulmonary stem, that there are different, um, that, that both the left and the right pulmonary artery are arising uh, from the truncal part. The, there's a bicuspid truncal valve here in the short axis. You can see the left vena cava superior here. And there was a right aortic arch. But if you look at the color flow, you are able to see there's a blue and red flow. So there's a sign for um, uh, a retrograde flow in the descending aorta, which is also be seen here in um, the Doppler of the um, uh, descending aorta with a diastolic runoff. So in this case, we have a small or very small for gestational age neonate with a common atrial trunk with aortic dominance. So would be type A2, um, left persistent vena cava superior, typical VSD, no relevant tricuspid re uh, valve regurgitation or stenosis, left aortic arch, and a diastolic runoff, which is due to the steel phenomenon by unrestricted flow to the pulmonary artery. And we have the following risk factors, prematurity, pulmonary overcirculation with the clinical signs of tachypne, low weight gain, high saturations, and a an high um, anti pro BNP as a marker for congestive heart disease. So this, in this small neonate, we started with vasodilators, and later with AZE inhibitors, beta blockers, and diuretics. But the congestive heart failure uh, could not be um, uh, uh, influenced by this medication and diastolic runoff uh, was going on and this child um, developed a necrotizing enterocolitis grade one. So what is your suggestion? What would you do in this case? In this case, we opted for a stage repair with bilateral pulmonary bending after six weeks. The aim of the bilateral bending is to reduce the excessive, excessive pulmonary overcirculation to reduce the risk of pulmonary hypertension and vasculopathy, to improve the gain of weight and prepare the child for corrective surgery. She's now waiting for this at home. In general, primary corrective surgery is planned one or two weeks after birth. But unfortunately, there are some cases, cases which may need early intervention as pulmonary bending and later corrective surgery. These are cases with low birth weight or low weight, necrotizing enterocolitis, cerebral bleeding or shock. Recent recommendations have been published for the optimal management of cases which common, with the common arterial trunk. And these recommendations um, cover nearly all topics regarding CAT, covering the pre and postnatal period long-term outcomes. Before planning corrective surgery, prenatal diagnosis has to be confirmed. And in general, transthoracic echocardiography is the imaging method of choice for pre and post surgical images. Additional imaging may be necessary um, in those cases um, who show a pulmonary dominant type. And then CT or CMR may be necessary. Rarely catheterization is needed as cath is, has also been determined as risky procedure in these neonates. The only case when cath is mandatory is a case with late presentation who needs to rule out or to determine the grade of pulmonary vasculopathy as well needs a pulmonary vasoreactivity test. Just uh, make it simple so we have the two different types uh, of uh, common arterial trunk, the aortic dominance and the pulmonary dominance. 
And we saw this very beautiful on uh, the figures uh, which have already been shown. Preoperative echocardiography has to show the following findings. There's a single trunk overriding the IVS and there must be a VSD or mostly there's a VSD. There are some rare cases without. You have to look for additional VSDs, evaluate trunkal valve stenosis or regurgitation, which is a significant risk factor. So there is a quadricuspid valve and a valve with pr probably one or two cusps. Look for the aortic arch. Is there a right aortic arch, which will be about in 33% of cases? And this is associated with genetic anomalies or will there be an interrupted aortic arch or coarctation? And we also have to look for the origin and size of pulmonary arteries, so for duct or collaterals. And coronary artery anatomy is also very important, as um, already shown by Monique, single coronary arteries and coronary artery malformations are quite often and do increase the post or perioperative risk. In this case, the left coronary artery arises from the right coronary arteries and has a posterior course. Pulmonary and more often systemic venous anomalies can be also seen, like the LSVC in our patient. Um, Neonates with uh, common arterial tr uh, trunk should not be discharged before operation because there is an increased mortality in late uh, operation. We have to, may, uh, to um, give medication for pulmonary overcirculation in those with uh, congested heart failure. And a rapid deterioration can occur in truncus valve stenosis or regurgitation. In cases of right aortic arch, sometimes tracheal compression can be found. And if children are symptomatic, a CT scan can be formed, can be performed. But be aware the CT scan should be done not with intubation, but with spontaneous breathing. In cases of an interrupted aortic arch, we need prostaglandin for ductal patency, as already mentioned. And all these neonates have a high risk of ne necrotizing enterocolitis. We did not talk about genetic abnormalities uh, or not so, uh, but we have to be aware for clinical point of view that those with a 22Q11 uh, deletion may have a risk of hypocalcemia and immune defects, which is very important post-surgically. This is a schematic graph of surgical procedures, and you may find detail, detailed information in the cons uh, consensus documents. Um, in this case of aortic dominance, uh, we have a nice trunk valve and um, nice aorta ascendance, and the pulmonary arteries are rising from the aorta or aortal part of the trunk. So the pulmonary arteries have to be excised. There has to be a ventriculotomy. Across the ventriculotomy, the VSD is closed. And then various forms of right ventricular to pulmonary artery connections are used in surgery in the neonate. Neonates without other associated problems have a very good outcome. But those neonates with a moderate, more than moderate trunkal valve regurgitation or interrupted aortic arch or in combination of both have a high risk of perioperative uh, death. What is the corrective surgery in those with pulmonary dominance? In these cases, the distal aortic arch is connected to the aorta a uh, patch is used to increase the size of the new neo aorta. The VSD is closed via ventriculotomy, and again, a right ventricle to pulmonary artery connection is used, as seen here in this schematic view 
this is the newly um, the neo aorta, the neo aortal arch, the pulmonary arteries, and then the right ventricle to pulmonary connection and the VSD closed. Additional risk factors associated with surgical outcomes are coronary artery anomalies and if there's a need for trunk valve, re valve replacement. So the surgeons always don't do trunk valve replacement in neonates, but only trunk valve repair. This is a nice paper of the results of the Melbourne group regarding the freedom from reoperation in those without interrupted aortic arch in blue line and in yellow line, those uh, op uh, operated with interrupted aortic arch. And we can see very nicely that nearly all patients or all patients need reoperations. At least one or more operation like trunk valve um, um, reconstruction and again RVPA conduits or homographs if they are grown out of their smaller homographs they got in the neonatal period. And later on, they also need repeated cath. What is the survival in common arterial trunk? And I think the survival is, I think, better in the last years and periods. And this group showed that the operative mortality is about 13%. There's a very low late mortality and if children are dying, they die within the first year of life. The risk factors for death are neonatal surgery with low operative weight and coronary artery anomalies. So the take home message is neonates with common arterial trunk have a high risk of congestive heart failure. They have associated non-cardiac risk factors. They need surgery before discharge. There are extra cardiac risk factors in about 35% with immune deficiency, seizures, hypocalcemia due to genetic factors. The highest risks are those with interrupted arch, relevant truncus valve regurgitation, as seen here. And there's always a need for reoperation and reintervention. This knowledge is necessary for appropriate prenatal counseling. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ulrika. Uh, Norman, do you have any comments? I'll just have to ask the permission to talk every time now. Yeah, I, I do have some comments. Um, in our own experience uh, in Truncus, which is quite extensive, uh, we have uh, not done uh, pulmonary artery banding except in the extreme uh, a premature infant. Our surgeons feel that uh, primary repair gives a better result and even down as low as 1.7, 1.6 uh, kilograms, we have done a formal repair of those patients. So I think that, that that is important. I think there's one message that needs to come out about Truncus, and I think Ulrika showed it beautiful, beautifully in that she said that you don't discharge a, a neonate with a common arterial trunk from the unit because the optimal time for a repair is about three to four weeks. After three to four weeks, the morbidity and the mortality start to increase. And that's not changed over the course of the time. So when you have a common arterial trunk, the time for operation is early. And the, the two big problems in common arterial trunk, the bad news is the valve itself. And I think uh, we saw very beautiful examples uh, that um, uh, Monique showed us of the abnormal trunkal valve. And the valve is often abnormal in the truncus. And so that is the long-term bugaboo because truncal insufficiency is a big, big problem. And it's certainly something that can be attacked by the surgeon at the time of the procedure, especially if there's a quadricuspid valve, you can suture some of the valves closed and you can do um, surgery on the valve to improve the prognosis. So it's not that uh, they can't be done, but it's an added risk factor. The other thing that I wanted to talk about 
is the question of, and you showed this very beautifully, Ulrika, with your coronary anomalies. Dr. Um, da Damien Bonnet, Damien Bonnet in Paris says the incidence of coronary anomalies in truncus arteriosus is 100%. Well, that may be a little high, but I think that the importance of Satan there is that we all have to pay attention to the, uh, the arterial valve. And there is an incidence of sudden death that occurs after truncal repair. And a, a much, many of those may be, in fact, the fact that the coronary arteries are intramural. And this is something that the surgeons need to, to look at. But the high orifice of the coronary artery is a problem, and it's a problem surgically, because if you take the uh, truncus off surgically and you take two bigger bites, inferiorly, you can cut into the left coronary artery, which is running behind there. So that is something that, as an echocardiographer, we have to pay great attention to. But um, overall, uh, Ulrika, I think you did a spectacular job, and it was a real privilege uh, to uh, see your mind at work uh, in discussing this abnormality. Oh, Rika, I, I, I just want to thank you again. And I remember the beautiful days in Bond with the picture you left. Now, um, the message um, that you're trying to say that if you have severe heart failure uh, in a premature baby, um, then banding uh, with, with a truncus and, uh, and uh, good size pulmonary arteries banding is an option, right? And this is the debate that uh, Dr. Silverman is saying uh, is, is it depends on the surgeons and what they like and the center experience. Now, how, how after the banding, the heart failure improved? Did you continue? What was the I mean? Give us a, a sort of a, of a dialogue of heart failure doses before and after banding so that the message can also help other people who have, who don't have, a surgeon who can operate at 1.7 kilos? So what we did, we continued the medication and uh, we discontinued diuretics, but we continued with the AZE inhibitors and beta blockers. And we saw that um, the child improved uh, with the weight. And uh, then also the BNP, so the uh, uh, BMP measures went down, not to normal, but they really were only 7,000. So they came from 30,000, they went down, the child was in better condition and we could discharge her in close follow-up because we uh, uh, don't want um, that uh, we have to wait too long. Uh, there's a risk for this uh, baby uh, in the kind of interstage uh, period. Were you assessing pulmonary hypertension? Because what Dr. Silverman is saying that we don't want to send them home and the surgeon is prepared to do one stage operation because of risk of pulmonary hypertension. So in this child, how would you measuring the pulmonary hypertension in the follow-up and that yes, before the start? Yes, it's very uh, simple doing echocardiography because you can get the gradient across the pulmonary banding by echocardiography and you can um, then assess the systolic blood pressure and try to, uh, yeah, to estimate the pulmonary pressure. And we would go for surgery as uh, soon as possible um, to avoid long-standing pulmonary hyperperfusion and then the risk of pulmonary hypertension. Joanna, do you have any comments? Uh, I think that uh, it is very important, this uh, problem with necrotizing enterocolitis, which we have to consider always if you have the abnormal truncal valve, and we had such problems. And then uh, I think that we should, uh, uh, it depends, of course, on, on the, uh, the union. They uh, were uh, data, and I remember our discussion with surgeons when <clears throat> we were preparing the uh, consensus statement about truncus. And some of the surgeons, and in some articles, there was written that the truncus should be operated on during the first two weeks of life. But uh, from my experience and from the experience of my country, uh, 
it is very rare that the Troncos uh, babies are operated in the first two weeks of life. And I don't know really if it is necessary, uh, but uh, I know that those children quite quickly deteriorate. I mean, they started, they are good, of course, when they have quite uh, high uh, uh, pulmonary resistance. We never know how long it will be. It would be nice if it would be longer than no in a normal newborn, but we, we can't uh, uh, control this. So at uh, at the moment when the vascular resistance is going down, those babies started with tachypnea. They don't eat. So then we should start with uh, with the drugs. And so. Uh, as uh, Ulrika told, uh, we usually start with uh, quite high doses of uh, sp uh, spironol, and then we add it, but it depends on the unit. Some of them uh, put them on IC inhibitors, but some of them just uh, put them on digoxin. So I don't know if it is real consensus. Well, I don't I, think so. I just want to make one comment that not that I like to disagree with everybody, but I think that uh, truncus is a surgical disease. Yeah, and I agree with you. Early. The, the tragedy that uh, we just have to talk about this for the participants is that not the, the child that's in florid heart failure. That's the easy one. But there are common arterial trunks that aren't in florid heart failure. They're in moderate heart failure and you can treat that heart failure medically. And the tragedy of that is that by even three to five months of age, you already have pulmonary vascular disease. Remember, yeah. you've got um, the flow in a truncus is between four and six cardiac outputs. And under high pressure, uh, that causes damage to the resistant vessels and you get early development of pulmonary vascular disease. And that becomes a tragedy because if you see a patient for the first time at uh, five or seven or eight months, as we have had in our experience, and you look at them, they already have pulmonary vascular disease and they're not operative candidates. So uh, I think that uh, we have to emphasize for our um, participants that this is a disease that it has to be handled surgically. Uh, you, you can argue about how to handle it. Uh, and it has to be done early. You know, if you wait for three, four months, you're really going to have patients who have pulmonary vascular disease. Then you close the ventricular septal defect and the pulmonary artery pre uh, pressure is elevated and you go on to develop pulmonary vascular disease. And that's an added problem. So I think that that's a tragedy that people uh, in the past have sort of misunderstood that you can wait till six and seven months to repair a common arterial trunk. It has to re be repaired early. And I applaud Ulrika's idea of not sending these patients out yeah. because they're terribly difficult to manage, especially when they're in heart failure. And I think the early treatment usually is better. Now, Ulrika works at a good center with the, an excellent surgeon, and of course, that is a problem. If you don't have surgeons that can do, uh, and, and some people have problems with homographs, getting the right homograph material to do early repairs, that also can become a problem. So there are a number of factors that are involved in what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, I just, uh, in our practice, I can't recall having ever banded a pulmonary artery in a trunk. We just go for straight repair. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Normal. Do they have do they have a, a raised pulmonary vascular resistance in utero? I don't do you think ever? In the I don't think so. And I, I mean, Everybody vascular has. resistance is high. The vascular resistance drops because of the oxygen after birth, and they go into failure very, very rapidly because they're putting out uh, four to six cardiac outputs across this common arterial trunk. And the other issue with this, the common arterial trunk is. Now, if you've got aortic insufficiency, then you're putting out the same number of cardiac outputs plus the aortic insufficiency. And then what happens when you look at the Doppler across the pulmonary valve, it looks very, very high. And um, so you think that there's truncal stenosis. 
Um, I know that the case that Joanna showed uh, was clearly um, uh, a patient with truncal stenosis, but uh, you can get um, a velocity of three meters per second across a normal aortic valve with exercise. And if you get three meters across a common trunk valve, uh, putting out five to six cardiac outputs, that doesn't mean that there's that equivalent of stenosis. So stenosis is a much less uh, uh, common problem. And uh, you have to be very careful in the diagnosis just on the basis of Doppler velocities. So you, you, the, the message is look at the morphology at the 2D before you put the Doppler on in a trunk and van, right? Right. Now, now I'm, my question was in utero, like uh, increased pulmonary vascular resistance and PIs across the pulmonary arteries as, as part of the, of the f increased flow uh, in utero or, or a reason, um, what I'm saying is the bed already, the vascular bed already damaged before delivery was a trunk and van. It is a very good question, actually, because we know, of course, that all fetuses had uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension, let's say, yes, but the flow across the lungs is different. And I think that it is, uh, at the moment, we not always, but in such uh, uh, lesions in which uh, we uh, suspect that it can be uh, pulmonary uh, hypertension in the newborn, we try to search uh, for the peripheral uh, uh, pulmonary oh flow yeah. and it is quite interesting because you can see that this flow changed during the examination that you know you have the uh, diastolic flow uh, throughout the cardiac cycle and then after 10 minutes uh, there is very high resistance and there is no uh, diastolic flow it is very interesting but I don't know if it is value or not and if you can predict anything but I think that it's worth certainly to, to look at it. But now, I have a this red question wind. now. Mm, it, I it's a red question. Wind. Much more mm. difficult because as pediatric cardiology is unpredictable and we were talking about the common arterial trunk with the normal biventricular heart. At the moment, I have the baby with the unbalanced AVSD with the severely underdeveloped right ventricle. So in fact, it is single ventricle anatomy with quite good mitral valve and with a truncus. Uh, and this baby developed the uh, original bind binding of the pulmonary uh, trunk arising from the common trunk, quite good valve. The baby was born as a, a small for gestational age with a weight of 1500 grams. At the moment is almost three kilos with the gradient across this original bending, almost 60 millimeters per mercury. What would, and he, he, he started to develop the, uh, we were thinking what to do with this baby because many people said, no, it's nothing to do. But then my surgeon said, oh, wait, we can do the bonding of the pulmonary artery. So the baby did it itself. What would be your approach next? I mean, how long can we wait? Because uh, we should do the next step would be Glenn, yes? I, as, oh, uh, that's I, always the problem, isn't it? <laughs> this is the <laughs> reason that I'm asking you because I need your help. This is the real baby. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's, this is, a, is this an invasive gradient or is this an echo gradient? It's a, an echo gradient. And it's a bending, a troop? A, a, a I mean, it was the narrowing of the... It, it is the narrowing Stenosis. of the erasing of the pulmonary... Okay. Uh, yeah, but it is, uh, to be uh, truthful, um, we need a low per, uh, pulmonary uh, uh, resistance and pressure. Yes, yeah. and, and so uh, I think uh, the pulmonary uh, uh, resistance and pressure mu must be high uh, because you did not uh, perform uh, surgical bending. The question is, uh, uh, if we follow Professor Silverman, we have to ask ourselves, we need Glenn and Fontan maybe. Yes. So, in this case, we should even think about a cath and even think about a, a, a BT, B, uh, so blood octausic shunt um, as a clearly defined uh, 
uh, with a clearly defined shunt size in this already uh, very diseased pulmonary uh, system. And uh, so, so you would cut him before uh, now. Yeah, and you have to, and you have to to mm -hmm. make sure. And it's difficult, but I don't know um, if if you are able, even with a four point one or uh, four point zero millimeter blood octopsy shunt, uh, this child has already pulmonary hypertension. So you have to use a defined diameter of a shunt okay. from the aorta to. Okay. To the pulmonary arteries, and uh, I, 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 you can use a four point zero uh, shunt and make clips the shunt mm -hmm. and see uh, get How the, with the baby will be doing. Yeah. Oh, just, and then okay. you have to wait, 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 and see if you can do Glenn and Fontan. No, the baby is one month old, and it really is uh, it work. growing nicely. So, 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 and it was she was too small to do anything before. So, you know, we had to wake. Unfortunately, she developed this narrowing, yes? But this was my question. Yeah, okay. yeah. but the, 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 you always have to think that you have, yeah, it, I don't know, it may work, but it's uh, in the sing, single yeah. ventricle, you have I to agree. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Norman. Norman, Dr. Silverman, uh, what's your comment? What I don't have any good. comments of any significance to make on this issue. I think that the assessment of pulmonary hypertension is a, one of the most difficult things in this condition. Mm -hmm. And as far as um, doing a, a Glen, uh, I, I think any patient that we get, that we can get over three months, we would prefer not to do a... Uh, a, um, uh, a, a BT. A, a, a BT. We prefer to go straight to the Glen if it's possible. Yeah. And of course, the, the one thing that um, we haven't talked about is to measure the transpulmonary gradient. And that seems to be very important. Uh, it's a catheterization okay. measurement, but you, there's no way that you can go to a Glen shunt without uh, preparing uh, the patient adequately and seeing whether they're capable of still getting it. And in this patient, there's a question of the pulmonary um, uh, vascular problem being present. So I think a transpulmonary gradient is important because if you have a high gradient, the chances of the successful Glen are going to be very poor. Now, I want to ask a question for the panel. What about the use of sildenafil here? Sorry? The use of sildenafil? In which sildenafil? case? Uh, in, 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 your, in, in yeah Viagra in, in, in your case uh, Rika in Juan, I mean uh, you have I mean the, the if you have a pulmonary vascular if you have what looks like clinical and echo wise pulmonary hypertension and you're preparing this baby for surgery um, is there a place for for uh, sildenafil in the management it's post post surgical we can use uh, 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 NO and uh, if uh, the child has problems and you want to continue with uh, pulmonary vasodilatation, you can give sildenafil. But uh, before surgery, I would never do it. I would do it post-surgically in early operation, early diagnosis, early operation. In those you wouldn't cases, do it because, because, could you clarify, is it because of the increased flow, right? You would not do this anti, uh, before surgery, yeah. right? No, because we have a shunt lesion. And yeah. if yeah. we lower the pulmonary vascular resistance, yeah, this is the increased flow. Makes no yeah. sense. Okay, uh, uh, Joanna, in your baby, yeah, I agree with Ulrika fully. Okay, so uh, the uh, only place for sildenafil is postnatal, after the you know, after the ICU, and for the follow up in the outpatient, maybe trying to help the baby gain weight and 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 get over the surgery. Norma, do you agree uh, with the use of sildenafil? Yes, in I think. Well, I agree with uh, Ulrika. I, uh, I think that uh, it's got a place afterwards. Uh, but that always, when you start having to use sildenafil, that sort of puts a flag up on the ultimate prognosis because uh, that says that there's some pulmonary vascular disease. And at that, it controlled, as in Joanna's case, where you're thinking you're dealing with single ventricle circulation, that's a real disaster. Listen, I just want to say that we've been going over two hours now, and I think that uh, 
for the sake of expediency, we have to bring the session to termination. So I'll let you wrap it up, uh, Rima. Well, I just want to thank Dr. Suleiman, who agreed with Eureka very, very much today. He just kept saying, I agree to Eureka, agree. And this is a big praise, but I want to thank um, uh, Professor Dangle. I want to thank Monique. I want to thank uh, Dr. Silverman, who always made a, added a beautiful flavor. So the take home message here is that we're dealing with a surgical disease. We are dealing with something that should not be delayed as much as possible because of the risk of primary hypertension. We are dealing with a disease with a strong genetic background where you really with every patient antenatally, we either do whatever genetic panel you have and I would go for uh, whole exome sequencing if possible. Number four, check the immunodeficiency of the babies and the thymus antenatally, if we can locate the thymus or not in the three vessel view. I think that's also something that we have to uh, look antenatally and postnatally, the, the D. George or, uh, or whatever variants, the 22Q they have. And I just want to thank everybody for this beautiful and very interesting talk. Thank you for accepting the invitation of Congenital Heart Academy. Uh, for uh, those who did not come early, as me, you can watch the whole series uh, on YouTube on the Congenital Heart Academy fetal series. This is the 14th episode, so you can have, you can really listen at the, and watch the 14 episodes on the YouTube channel. Thank you again, and have a good day. I just want to add one quick point about uh, the 22Q11, and that's we talk about immune deficiency, we talk about truncus, we talk about hypercalcemia, but uh, you know, there is another issue with the, this condition, and that's the intellect. And the average IQ of a 22Q11 is uh, well under 100 points. So there's another problem, there's also the palate issues and so on and so forth. And there's a high incidence, about one in four, maybe one in five patients that has major psychiatric disease as well. So when you think of the burden of 22Q11, it's a big burden. And that's the last point I want to make. And the recurrence risk is high as well. I think some of the 22Q, uh, like George, and some of them on videocardiofacia, whatever, maybe it could be a tosomal dominant. So right. um, it could be 50% recurrence or it could be wh whatever, whatever um, uh, deletions you found in your West or on your uh, fish or whatever um, you, you're doing a uh, genetic analysis. So recurrence risk is, if you have 22Q is, is quite high. Do the panel agree to the recurrence risk of 22Q? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, any comment? I would just no, like to thank you all of you to inviting us and I think that uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, webinar and meeting and it was always a great pleasure uh, to discuss with uh, Professor Silverman and with you Rima and of course with my great colleagues Ulrika and Monique and I am dreaming about our next course. Yeah. We'd like to thank the AEPC because this is part of the fetal group of the AEPC. Uh, thank you so much for accepting the invitation of Congenital Heart Academy. You were all wonderful today. Everybody should get a round of applause. <laughs> Great talk. Thank you. Well, thank nice you both you. for your charming <laughs> chairman, okay. chairmanship. And also, uh, thanks a lot. It was wonderful to see you, Ulrika and Joanna, also again. And I hope the next time will be a physical meeting again. It would be wonderful. Sure. We'll be yeah, very happy. I'll try to keep you busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, have a nice evening, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.